All right, everyone, let's, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening to you and welcome to Grace Anglican Church at night. It is fantastic that you can be here and join us this evening. If you're new or visiting or revisiting, a special warm welcome to you. And we're glad that you've decided to join us tonight. I hope that your time here will be of great spiritual benefits. My name is Fletcher and I'm one of the members of this congregation. Before we sing our first two songs, let me read from the Psalms of Psalm 24. Psalm 24 says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For He has laid the foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates, rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the, king, then the king of glory will come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the king of glory. Before we sing our first two songs, befittingly one of those being Psalm 24, the king of glory, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for this time together to be in fellowship with one another. As we praise you in song, come before you in prayer and hear your word read and taught to us. We pray that you continue to grow us and shape us to be more like your son and that your name is glorified in all that we do. Amen. Amen. Please stand. We'll sing our first two songs. Jesus 
As you remain standing, uh, let us sing a fairly well-known, a very beautiful hymn about persevering in Christ with joy amidst great sorrow and suffering. We're going to sing, It Is Well. You guys can sit down. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I believe we're now going to say the Apostles' Creed together. As we come together, let's remind one another and affirm with Christians across the ages what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Apostolic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We're now going to have a Easter mission spot. I'm going to invite Ben up. Evening, everyone. I add my welcome to that of Fletcher. Uh, if you're new and visiting, we're delighted you've decided to join us tonight. My name's Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Henlican at night. Uh, for our Easter mission spot tonight, a couple of things uh, that are really important. Easter uh, is really, really close. Good Friday is five days away. And uh, we really want to be inviting friends, family, neighbours to come to both our Good Friday services, Good Friday meetings, and our Easter Sunday meetings. Now, Good Friday meetings, uh, Night Church isn't having one. Harrington Park Anglican, which meet at Harrington Park Public School, and uh, uh, Gledswood Hills Anglican, which meets at Gledswood Hills Public School, are both having Good Friday gatherings, obviously, as you can see on the screen before me, uh, on this coming Friday, 9.30 a.m. And for Night Church, it'd be wonderful if we would disperse and go to those two and, uh, you know, have a night off on Friday night. Uh, But for Night Church on Easter Sunday, uh, you'll have noticed on your seat that you've actually got a little flyer that you can even use to give to your friend, neighbour, whatever, in order to bring them on, which has all the details and information. Now, uh, in addition to these things, uh, we still have X bundles of flyers to invite people to our various Easter gatherings. Now, X, I don't know how many is left. If you can see on that back table there and count how many there are, well, that's whatever X equals. Um, It would be wonderful if uh, people could grab one or two bunches of those, choose a nice cool afternoon, you know, like tomorrow, walk around the little bit of the neighbourhood that's written on the map there and chuck them in people's letterboxes to let them know. I was very heartened to see that one of our very own was doing just that this afternoon. He knows who he is. I'm not going to embarrass him, but good on you, brother. Uh, Now, it's also the case that we're obviously uh, using sort of Easter to increase the evangelistic temperature of our own church and churches around us. So I'm going to lead us in prayer for two other uh, churches in our area, namely Minto and the Oaks, that God uh, would bless their efforts in their Easter missions as well. So let me lead us in prayer. Father God, we give you great thanks for the new people who have joined Minto and Lincoln Church over the last year and that their church family has worked hard at welcoming and integrating newcomers. We pray that your people in Minto would be passionate about sharing the gospel with their community and seeing the urgency of the mission of Jesus uh, and that they would hold firmly to the hope that they and we all have in Christ. We ask you that many people would come along uh, to the Hope Explored course that Minto Anlican will be running after Easter. And Father, for your church at the Oaks Anlican, we ask that their members would be bold in inviting friends and family to their Easter gatherings and that many would come along to the Hope Explored course that they also are running after Easter. Uh, Father, we ask that the use of share cards would prove effective uh, in people at the Oaks praying for and looking for opportunities to share the gospel with three people who are yet to know the joy of living with Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. May you bless the outreach efforts of the Oaks Anglican by bringing many more people from both the Oaks and Oakdale into your kingdom through the message Uh, of the gospel of Jesus and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Fletch. It's time now for some church family news to find out what's going on in the life of our church. First up, the night church weekend away. To tell us more about it, please welcome Jaden Inglis. Yes, Night Church Weekend Away is happening. Uh, May 17th to the 19th. Be there or be square, because you won't be around. Um, If you've never been to a Weekend Away before, I would highly encourage it. It is extremely good, extremely beneficial. Uh, Generally, what it uh, might entail would be a few Bible talks over the weekend. Um, This year would be given to us by a particularly gifted speaker, Philip Jensen. He's uh, pretty top-notch. Um, lots of organised 
all in fun, like a trivia night that we had last year, which is um, interesting. Uh, and I'd argue, most importantly, uh, fellowship with one another, whether that's people we already know and deep building relationships or meeting new people. Yeah, both are very important things. For me, last year, my two favourite things was the uh, series we did through Colossians. That was really good, and I'd never touched that book before. And um, secondly was at night, just playing board games and chatting with lots of people, people I haven't met before, people I have, um, yeah, lots of good fellowship. Um, I'm sure that everyone who went last year and previous times would have lots of fun, uh, interesting, or possibly even wacky stories to share. Uh, Into some of the nitty-gritty, the weekend away will be held at Wedderburn Christian Campsite, which is close to here, it's like 30 minutes, it's like in between... Appen and Campbelltown, so it's not too far. Um, like I said, Philip Jensen will be speaking, and the topic for the weekend away is the person and the work of the, sorry, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if that topic intrigues, confuses, or entices you, then it's for you. Or if it doesn't do any of those things, then it's also for you. <laughs> um, yes, early bird red Joe, sign up ends on the 12th of April, so if you'd like to save some dollar dues, get in quick. Uh, you'll also get our first reserves of rooms, maybe. Um, sign up through the Connect form, um, and if you have any problems with financials or travels, then I'm sure you can ask any staff members uh, for assistance or wisdom, either or. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, this will be an awesome weekend, and I encourage all of you who are members of our church to be there. It'll be great. Also coming up, we have a topical trivia night. Uh, this year, two people among our congregation, uh, Lucy Cameron and uh, who we've just heard from, Jaden Inglis, uh, are doing Year 13 at YouthWorks College. Um, so at this time, we want you to know that they are organising a fundraiser to help cover the cost of their mission trip to Fiji, which will be in a few months' time. Uh, after Easter, we'll hear more about this uh, from Jaden and Lucy. But for now, put it in the diary, it's up there, April 27, 7.30, uh, I believe it's at the hub. Is that right? Awesome, that's, that's a good thing. Um, yep, and that's it. If you want to um, find more about what Lucy and Jaden are doing at Year 13, um, feel free to speak to them anytime. If you'd like to know how they can help with the cost, um, how, how, yeah, how they can help with the cost of the mission trip. Uh, yeah, also please talk to them. That would be good. Also, just to let you know that when you received your handout, um, there's a QR code. Um, it's a communication, it's, a, it's an online connect form. Uh, it's a great way um, to be in contact with our ministry team. Uh, and so it's great, it's a good way to let us know that you're here uh, by just filling that out. Um, if, you, if you want to sign up for the, if you want to register for the weekend away, I believe there's an option um, to do that as well. If you have any questions, comments, uh, or prayer points, there's also, a, there's also a good time for you to put those down as well. There'll be a dedicated, there'll be a dedicated time to do that uh, uh, later in the service, but feel free to fill that in during the night as it pans along. And also just a reminder for the regular members uh, that we have a manual giving box up the back, um, and also our church's bank details are also on the handout on the bottom corner. We are going to sing again. Yeah. Come and rain. Please stand. Brothers and sisters, the wonderful thing about this song is it uh, begins with a very humble and very true declaration that uh, Christians are far from perfect. Lord, we come crushed and broken. Lord, we come in time of need. What a wonderful uh, way uh, to begin encouraging one another that we're not going to pretend to be better than we are in the sight of our Heavenly Father. 
Uh, but it is Jesus and his reign and his rule that makes us righteous in the sight of God. It's Jesus that we can rely and depend on uh, to be seen holy in his sight. Uh, let us encourage one another with the wonderful truth of this song, Come and Reign. We've come to uh, the highest point of our time together, and that is hearing uh, God's Word read to us. Systematically, as a congregation, we've been going through the book of Mark. Uh, this week, uh, we'll be hearing from Ben as he speaks on Mark 11. If you don't have a Bible and would like a Bible, uh, a very kind person will come and give you a Bible. So if you don't have a Bible and need one, just stick up your hand and uh, someone will be with you very shortly. <clears throat> Tonight we've got two Bible readings. I believe the first one is Malachi chapter 2 from verse 17 to chapter 3 verse 5. And our second Bible reading will be from Mark chapter 11 verse 1 to 25. Before we read God's Word, Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation 
through faith in your Son, Jesus. Teach us through your word, equip us for every good work, for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Awesome. When we invite Seth, he's going to read the Bible for us. Yep, so the first passage is Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, through to chapter 3, verse 5. It says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, All who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or, Where is the God of justice? I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. And then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. The second passage is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 25. If I can find it. It says... As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tails of money chargers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is, it is, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This is the word of the Lord. All right, before I start tonight, I'm going to ask a favour. Could some kind soul go to that big door and press the green up button and lift it so it's a little bit higher than me? Could some other kind soul, while it makes the terrible noise that it's going to make, work out how to switch off those two fans... You can work it out. You've got to go to the wall. It's just a PowerPoint somewhere. And you can all talk amongst yourselves for about 30 seconds. <laughs> That'll do.
Well done, you've all done fantastically tonight. I just think it's really important that uh, we can hear really well and not be too hot, so this kind of solves both problems. Just want to see if I've got the power. Yes, I do. Wonderful. Uh, please do keep your Bibles open at our sermon passage, which is Mark chapter 11, 1 through 25, and I'll lead us briefly in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise You uh, that You're the God who speaks and You speak in Your Word and by the power of Your Holy Spirit that is at work in and among us. Help us now to concentrate, to tremble and to rejoice at Your Word, to take it to heart, that we might become more and more like our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, the overturning of the tables in the temple courts could rightly be seen as the one time that we know about, the one time in the Bible that Jesus is physically violent in his behaviour. Uh, you might remember that in John's parallel account of this same event, Jesus fashions a whip out of cords and actually uses that as well to drive people and animals out of the temple courts. Now, a violent outburst or even just an angry verbal outburst is usually a reason to not take somebody seriously. Some years ago, a friend of mine who happens to be a minister at a different church uh, had uh, someone within his congregation who was uh, very unsatisfied and disgruntled about some of the choices that uh, the church had taken and this person very sadly did that thing that sometimes happens, they gathered a few people around them and sort of saw themselves as the resistance to the establishment that is the church and this friend of mine, the minister, uh, said, I'm praying that we can like have a, a civil conversation and kind of work things out before the AGM, the upcoming meeting but he said, I might also pray that he loses his temper. And I said, what? what? What are you talking about? He goes, oh yeah, you know, like if, if the person's not going to settle down, then a really helpful thing is if, if, if they absolutely flip their lid and just yell and scream in front of other people, because as soon as that happens, all the people that had sort of cited just suddenly back off and say, I'm not going to have anything to do with this guy, right? We all know it, we all sense it. It's as soon as someone has a, an angry verbal outburst, suddenly you're like, yep, I'm not going to pay attention to that. But when it's Jesus who's only ever sinless and holy, when it's Jesus doing the outburst, especially when it's the one violent outburst that the Gospel writers have recorded for us, then it's the opposite. It is the wise thing to do to pay especially careful attention to what is happening and to why it's happening. Uh, you might have read the book of Proverbs once or bits of it, it's always the wise who heed the rebuke of the Lord, it's the wise who take the king's anger seriously, uh, it's the wise who are trained by the rod of discipline. Uh, it, in Psalm 2, the great psalm about God's Son, the Messiah, uh, it is wise to take into account that with the Lord's Messiah, His wrath can flare up in a moment. Our world will often scoff at the notion that Jesus rightly expresses the wrath of God towards sinners and, and sinful activity. But we're not the world, our job is actually to be different, our job is to be wise and to carefully take to heart what we learn from Jesus in His calculated but nonetheless violent activity in the temple courts, along with the illustration that He gives of it with the cursing of the fig tree. Now, I'm going to spill the beans just a little bit up front. Uh, the thing that provokes Jesus to such an extreme response is what I'm going to call religious pragmatism, religious pragmatism. Now, Ben, what's religious pragmatism and why does it anger Jesus to the point of violence and what, what, how should we respond to it? Great question, that's what we're going to find out as we look at the first half of Mark chapter 11 tonight. So, let's get into it. If you're a, a note taker, we're at point one in your outline, uh, the Messiah comes to His city. Now, for a bit of helpful context and background, if probably in your Bible where you got open, if you just skip back a few verses, I think it's 1043 or, or 44, something like that, um, you'll see that Jesus and His followers had been uh, at Jericho and that here, uh, in, in chapter 11, verse 1, they're at uh, Bethphage, Bethany and the Mount of Olives and that means they've been on what would have, I think, been called the Pilgrim's Journey, that's what it would have been known, on, uh, known of, uh, where you sort of enter the Promised Land from the eastern side and the first big city you come to is Jericho, then you head from there all the way into the capital of, of God's Promised Land, namely Jerusalem. Once upon a time, the great King David, centuries before this, had very loosely speaking probably made a similar 
journey. And we actually looked at this not that long ago. Remember going through 2 Samuel, that guy Absalom, David's son, kind of rebelled against David and David got booted out and he had to go even east of the Jordan. But then when, uh, of course, David ended up booting him and when David comes back as the, the reigning king from Jericho into Jerusalem, those that had been sort of faithful to David were going like, yes, this is awesome, the, the king's here, the king's back. Those who had been uh, unloyal to David, it was not a good day for them. Now, with that little bit of background, uh, come again to the start of our passage, chapter 11, verse 1, Jesus arrives at the last place on that journey, namely Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. And uh, fun fact, Bethphage actually means house of unripe figs. So I can't help but wonder if it kind of is Mark suggesting that when Jesus re-enters the city of the king, of which he is the ruler, not everything is going to be exactly as it should be. Now, Jesus plans his grand entry into Jerusalem for really the last time. This is like the last week of his life, right? He plans his, his, his last big entry into Jerusalem with supernatural insight and power. He orchestrates the borrowing of a donkey for the occasion and if you look at verse 2 there, 11 verse 2, you'll see it's a colt that has never before been ridden because I think the rule of Jesus and, and the kingdom that he establishes is going to be unlike anything that's ever come before or since. But more importantly, the choice of a donkey is that it greatly contrasts with what you would expect of a victorious king entering his capital. So you'd expect the victorious king to have the war horse and the chariot in his procession. But Jesus goes the lowly, humble option of the donkey. In fact, Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy made centuries beforehand from Zechariah who looked forward to the time when Israel's uh, restoration would be ushered in by a conquering king who, yes, is mighty in victory, yet who is somehow also gentle and lowly in heart. I'll put the words from that prophecy on the screen. This is Zechariah chapter 9. And verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, yes, but also lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so you see, as Jesus here enters Jerusalem, he is unambiguously making the claim to be that long-awaited Messiah whom the prophets had foretold. Jesus clearly demonstrates to all who would see that he is the Christ. And that's how many people, very rightly, looked at him. Uh, look from verse 8 in chapter 11. Verse 8, it says, Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, if you don't know, the word Hosanna simply means save. And in this context, it's probably an expression of praise. They're saying, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And we expect that you have the power to make Israel great again. They only had palm branches. They didn't have red hats that said make Israel great again. But it's the same idea, right? You have the power. And that means they're probably thinking, you have the power to make us an independent nation, that is to boot the Romans, who are our overlords, and to make us independent. Later on, these, many of these people would learn what save Hosanna would really mean for the son of David, who would somehow be both mighty in victory, yet also humble and lowly. But nonetheless, they were right to recognise Jesus as the Messiah, who would re-establish God's great kingdom that was once ruled over by David. It's quite understandable, by the way, that a tradition within the church has actually sprung up uh, from this particular event, and of course we call it Palm Sunday. Uh, there's no requirement to celebrate it or even know about it, but, you know, it's a cool thing, I can understand why it happens. But not only did Israel's prophets set up an expectation that uh, the Messiah would enter his holy city to re-establish God's kingdom, that, that was a big expectation set up, but there was another really big one that the prophets set up. They also spoke of a time when God himself, the Lord, Yahweh, that is God himself, after a time of exile, would make a glorious return to his temple. Same prophet, Zechariah, hints that 
both these events, the Messiah coming to His city and the Lord returning to His temple, could potentially coincide. The verse I read you before was Zechariah 9.9, I'm just going to show you the one, one verse literally before it, Zechariah 9.8, that speaks about this other event. It says, but I, and that's God, I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. See, Jesus has made the point that He's the mighty, lowly Messiah who has come into His city. And at the same time, it seems, He now makes it clear that He's also the Lord who comes to His temple, which again will mean salvation for some and judgment for others. And it will mean you might naturally think that, well, He's going to overthrow the Roman Empire, He's going to make us a great nation again. Verse 11 sounds ominous, like the calm before the storm, as God and His Christ do ride into their city slash temple and find things wanting. Read it with me, verse 11 of chapter 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, He went out to Bethany with the twelve. You hear the ominous note there, he looked around at everything, I've got to do a big job, it's going to take a while, it's too late, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. Now, we would be right to expect that verse 11 should say, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the palace, where he sat on the throne of David, probably booted out Herod, right? That's what you, you could expect. But you see, unlike King David... Jesus is also the Lord, He is also God, Yahweh, who has now come back to His own house in order to re-establish His divine rule. And when He looked around at those temple courts, He was not happy at the state of His house. So unhappy, in fact, that He plans to see the old temple destroyed and a new one rebuilt. And he illustrates this very idea to his disciples by the cursing of the fig tree. So read with me from verse 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now, I know that when you first read this and you're not really thinking about the context, it seems a bit funny and a bit weird. You know, like, why is Jesus sort of cursing this poor, innocent fig tree when it's not even the season for figs, right? You might think, surely Jesus could have figured that out. <laughs> Thanks, I'm here every Sunday. Maybe some people think, oh, maybe he prefers dried figs, right? That's why he withered it, you know, it's going to... Anyway. But once you consider the context, once you remember what to realise uh, what Jesus is showing uh, with very powerful imagery, you, you sort of see it's about the temple. He's saying that God's house is not producing what it should be and so I am going to come and scrap it. And so that's why, from the next verse, verse 15, we start to get the real fireworks. Read with me from verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and will not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Now, I'll explain briefly what's going on here. First century, temple in Jerusalem, the temple's got the most holy place, where only the high priest can go in once a year, then the holy place, uh, where only uh, Levitical uh, people can go in. You've got the altar, where sacrifice is made, and then you've got what's called the, the outer courts. Now, for those first three places, the ho most holy place, the holy place, the, the altar, only Jews can go in there, Jews only, no Gentiles. But in the outer courts, Gentiles may come if they wish to approach the Lord of heaven and earth, Yahweh. Now, typically, 
Jews who would have come for the high holidays, which includes Passover, would have thought if they'd have come from a long way, it's going to be too long and hard to carry little lamby to make a sacrifice. So, you know, I'll just bring some money. When I get there, I'll exchange it for the right currency so then I can buy a little lamby or buy a little dove and then I can sacrifice the dove. That's all good. But the buying and the selling, instead of being outside the temple courts, is within the temple courts. In other words, it's now overcrowded, it's hard for Gentiles to get in there because all the Jews are in there doing their Jew thing for other Jewish people and so they're they're thinking, well, who cares, the Gentiles can't make a sacrifice anyway, forget them, right? It's really an an image of saying this is kind of our club or, to put it a little bit more sharply, it's kind of saying we want to do what's practical and convenient for us even if it disregards what God really desires. You see, the the part of the Bible that Jesus quotes, the first part's from Isaiah 56, 7, it's when there's this great expectation that one day the temple mount of the Lord will be raised higher than all the other mounts and and, and nations will flock to it. My house, says God, will be called a house of prayer for all nations. I want all people to come in. I look forward to the time where non-Jews can worship Yahweh just the same as Jews. That's a great desire of God. But in order to make things easy and keep it practical, I forget the dumb Gentiles, we'll just sell our stuff in here, we don't need them in here anyway. That, that's the kind of thing. And that absolutely burns Jesus with anger. And so he says, you guys have done the kind of corruption that happened in the time of Jeremiah. You're, you're paying attention to the rituals, but you're not doing anything about justice, mercy, the kinds of things that God desires. You have made it a den of robbers. It should have been a house for all nations, but just for the sake of your club mentality and your convenience, you've made it a den of robbers. And that's what drives Jesus to to absolutely go nuts. Uh, I call this religious pragmatism, doing what's easy or satisfying for us, but actually ignoring what God desires in, in, in a religious setting or context. Now, thankfully, heaps of people were getting what Jesus was on about and they loved it. And of course, that made the religious leaders really jealous. So, read with me from verse 18. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And of course, it's here we might begin to get the hint of how it is that this victorious Messiah would yet re-establish God's true temple and God's true people in the most humble and lowly manner. That is, by being executed by those who are far too religious to recognise or honour God's desires. The world is filled with people, by the way, who are far too religious to recognise God's desires. And Jesus would allow that to happen because in the end it would actually be the only way that anybody, which includes everybody in this room and myself, could be saved from the curse of judgment that we deserve. The confirmation that the corrupted temple would indeed fall under God's wrath and under his curse gets confirmed in the last bit of our section. Look with me from verse 19. Verse 19, when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, that's the third day now, confirmation day, in the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. In other words, totally dead, kaput, gone. Verse 21, Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And again, I really love Peter. It's all like, you can't tell the tone, but it kind of sounds like, would you believe it, Jesus? You did a thing and it worked, you know? You curse a tree and it's dead, right? Maybe it's, a bit, maybe, maybe it's in fear. You, you did this and, oh, oh my goodness. Is this what you're going to do with it? Te- oh, oh boy. It's a bit like what we had in that first reading from Malachi in chapter 3. The Lord will come to his temple, yes, but he will be like a refiner's fire. And that would beg a very important question for the apostles. In their minds, the temple in Jerusalem, that represented the rule of God over all who truly would belong to the renewed kingdom of David, the kingdom of God. How on earth would it be possible 
for God's kingdom to come and for it to come so powerfully that it would include people from all nations if the temple in Jerusalem would wither and die. For you and I, we don't think that's a big deal, but for the apostles, that would have been, that would have been like a crisis of faith. How can you get rid of the temple and still have the kingdom of God come in a big way for all the nations? Like, that, that, that does not compute. Now, Jesus knows this is a big problem. That's why he immediately teaches them that, yes, God will re-establish his temple, but not as a physical building with a system of priesthood, but with an earth-changing movement that we now call the apostolic faith. The apostles have just learned, even if only to a small degree, that the old temple is going to wither and die. And so Jesus immediately then instructs them. He sees the problem and he addresses it. Verse 22, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Translation, this mountain, that is this temple mountain, which has now become synonymous with corrupt religious pragmatism. You guys, you apostles, you could say, be overthrown and believe that God must therefore have some new way of establishing his kingdom such that all nations can be involved. Well then, yes, that certainly will happen. And you know what? With the apostles, that certainly did happen they did become witnesses to the destruction of the true temple, that is the body of Jesus as he was crucified for us. And they also became witnesses to the raising up of the new temple, that is Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. And also, they began preaching the gospel of forgiveness to people from Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Those who recognise now, Jew or Gentile, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the divine God and Son of God, they become part of his body, that is the church, which happens to be the new temple of God. And that's how the church is spoken about in the New Testament. Jesus was right when he said to the apostles, verse 24, therefore I tell you whatever you ask for in prayer obviously in the context of establishing the true temple of God, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, not when you stand at the altar or stand at the temple, it's just when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. In other words, Jesus is saying it's no longer the sacrificial system but it's now the word of the apostles, the apostolic gospel, by which people will stand forgiven or not. And by the way, Jesus himself modelled the kind of forgiveness uh, that he's talking about really spectacularly when he prayed, Father, forgive them to the the very people that were murdering the Son of God. And um, just as a little aside... I don't know what kind of week everyone's had. That could be something that you really need to be reminded of uh, this week. If Jesus so desperately wants to forgive even those who are murdering the Son of God, well then how much more is he desperate to forgive you, brother and sister, who are a child of God, who might at the moment feel hopeless and despondent or downcast on account of your many failings this week? He really is the gentle and lowly Messiah, who really is victorious on your behalf over all your sin. And that is the message he really did give to the apostles. And that is the new world changing movement by which we all become the household of God. You truly can rejoice in your Redeemer, wellspring of your soul, and be satisfied in him alone. But it's also bigger than just the Temple Mount. In many places in Scripture, mountains are used to symbolise strong empires and seas that crash against the mountains are often throughout Scripture used to symbolise wars fought uh, in the hope of conquering. 
those strong empires. As the victorious Messiah, Jesus would, in the end, actually, yes, conquer the Roman Empire. Just as he would conquer all rebellious nations and all peoples. But he would do it in a way that would be hard for people to believe. You'd have to have serious faith in God to see it happen. He'd do it by dying to pay for the sins of all his people and by rising to create the new temple, namely the church, and by having this message recorded and spread by the apostles, people who would soon be accused, to quote Acts 17, of turning the world upside down, or you might say of throwing a mountain into the sea. So with these last few verses here, I know that they are often used as a bit of a proof text for the whole name it and claim it prosperity preachers, which if you took it out of context would make sense, you know, pray really hard and believe really hard and you'll be given a thing and, and if your life goes bad it's because you don't have enough faith and you haven't prayed hard enough, right? It's obviously stupid. But an evangelical Christian philosopher, and they do exist, an evangelical Christian philosopher named Philip Carey, in a great little article that I read this week on these verses, puts it like this, and I'll put it up on the screen. When Jesus says, you, in this word of promise, verse 24, uh, he is first of all addressing his disciples, the people who will become the apostles. To pray in faith, in accordance with this promise, is to pray in their faith, the apostolic faith, which is the faith that has already overturned the world. Whenever we pray in this faith, we should believe that we have received what we ask for, just as the Lord has promised. To give you a really good and obvious example of praying for something that we can know that we will get that we ask for, how about this one? Dear God, please establish your kingdom on earth as it currently is in heaven. You see, you can be assured that that will happen and in fact you can be assured that that has already begun to happen. The proof is sitting in this room. Another simple one that I can't help but mention because I don't know everyone who's here tonight would be the prayer for someone to turn and become a follower of Jesus. Something like, dear God, I know that Jesus died to pay for my sins, that he rose to give me new life and that he'll come back to judge the living and the dead. So, Hosanna, save, please save me and help me to live your way from now on. You know, that's something you are welcome to pray. And if you pray it, believing it to to be true, believing God is capable of granting your repentance and faith and, and forgiveness in Jesus then it is as good as answered in the affirmative. But for those of us who have turned and put our faith in Jesus as the Messiah, which I certainly hope is all of us, then given that we are now the new temple of God, given that we are now the body of Jesus, and that Jesus is clearly angry at religious pragmatism, well then, frankly, in humility... And therefore, in wisdom, we always would be right to think, well, how can we minimise and get rid of religious pragmatism within this temple? Whilst we here, Grace Anglican, are rightly not into religious rites and, and, and rituals, we don't have candles, bells and smells, I'm not wearing robes, you know, we don't do any of that stuff. It is still easy, this side of heaven, to fall into habits where we're more about doing what's easy or satisfying to us in a way that fails to take God's expressed desires into account. Uh, To sharpen that, and to say it a bit more simply, I think we sometimes need to repent, or at least to be ready and willing to repent, of what I'm going to call religious consumerism. What do I mean by consumerism? Well, most of our lives are sort of run within this paradigm of we pay for a service and the service is given to us and if it's good we say thanks and if it's bad we get onto Google or Trustpilot and we write a negative review, right, saying this service sucked and here's why, blah, blah, blah. It's easy to let that way of thinking sort of slip into church life and culture Uh, but it would clash with the great desire that Jesus has. You see, Jesus expresses his desire for the church, his desire for the church and you can read all about this in in Ephesians chapter 4, is that all of us 
function as part of the body, part of the body of Christ. And as each part does its functioning, so we build one another up in Christian maturity. That kind of model just can't fit with the consumerist model. The reformers had a really good word for this. They called it the priesthood of all believers. There is no one part of the body of Christ that is more useful or less useful than another or more valuable or less valuable than another. It's not like there's the clergy who are the establishment and then there's the laity who are the customer and when their things are going well they're happy and when things aren't good they're the resistance who need to stand up to the establishment. That, that, that's consumerist thinking. You, you see hints of things like that when people say things like, well, I'm really disappointed that the church hasn't done this. I'm really annoyed that the church hasn't done that. But you see, the problem with saying something like that is you're immediately distancing yourself from the body of Christ and you're making this kind of separation and there's a service that hasn't suited my needs. You see, you're putting yourself on the outside. And I have heard things like this. Why not something like, we have this issue, how can we fix this, what can I do? That, that, that would be a body mentality rather than a consumerist mentality. You see it sometimes when people decide, hopefully for good reason, there's all sorts of reasons, but, but decide to, to no longer fellowship with, with a particular congregation. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why you, you could and should move churches, okay? But sometimes, instead of leaving People just stop attending and there's a huge difference. See, if someone leaves, we, I, I was delighted, I'm really sad, but I was delighted the way James and Bridget left. They, we had them up here, we interviewed them, we talked about what they're doing and why. That was wonderful. But a consumer mentality wouldn't think like that, they just stop attending. And when someone does that, I'm really worried about them because it means that the way they're thinking is not relationally like I'm part of this body in this movement, it's just like, there's this thing, I've had enough, I'm out of here. That's a consumerist mentality. Now, I'm not saying, this, is, you know, this isn't a big, you know, rouse from Ben, I'm not saying we're sort of like, gee, we've really got to repent of this big consumerist mentality problem, bang, bang, bang. Ben is not overturning the tables, all right? It's just something I think we need to have a little bit of, of awareness of, just to keep on the radar, to keep thinking, well, how can I fellowship with my congregation in a way that's not necessarily about just my desires and my convenience, but about what God... Can I draw a line from God's desire to how I think and act and behave within my church family? It's that kind of thing. How about I uh, lead us in prayer and it's up to Fletcher whether we have question time or not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and, uh, and praise you for your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the mighty, victorious and conquering Messiah who has conquered sin and death and the devil and therefore who has the power to save us and to transform us into his body, the new temple, the temple of the living God. Father, we thank you that Jesus is lowly and humble, that he is absolutely approachable, that he is so filled with love and compassion for sinners like us that he longs to forgive even the people that were murdering him and therefore we can be assured that no matter how poorly we may have served him this week, that we can rest assured that he loves and forgives us. Heavenly Father, may we so love you that we take seriously your desires and not let our own comfort or convenience get in the way of us living in accordance with your will and we ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, oh, I thought it was just come up with a song. Uh, yay or nay? Yeah, only if there are questions, only, only for a couple of minutes. I don't want to spend too long doing this. Uh, all right, Lincoln. Uh, uh, excellent question. So, why is there no verse 26? If you look in your Bible, it goes straight from 25 through 27. Now, you might, if you've got a good Bible, you'll have a little footnote that says there's an extra bit of information from that last verse. So Jesus in the last verse says, for if you forgive others, then your, your heavenly Father will forgive, forgive you. And then some Bibles, put up your hand if you've got a Bible that has that little extra bit of explanation down the bottom. Can someone who's actually, I don't, I don't have my paper Bible, someone read out what those extra verses are really loud. Who wants to read it out for me? You got it, Eli? Can you yell?
trespasses. Now that's true and you can read very similar things in other Gospels. I think you see that in, in, in Matthew at the end of the Lord's Prayer. If you do not forgive, neither will your Heavenly Father forgive you. However, some manuscripts, of which we got hundreds of copies, probably means a small collection of them, and you can understand that a scribe who's originally cop making a copy of this might think, oh, I know that in, in Matthew on that other gospel, it has this ex little bit of extra explanation, so I'll put it in here. But when it comes to translation, the rule of thumb is that the more explanation, the less likely it is to have been original. And so once upon, our, once upon our, a time we, with uh, uh, the science of, of um, manuscripts, work and, and translation, people had that in there and they had it as a verse, but since then the translators, at least of the NIV, have gone, pretty sure this is not original. It's true, you can read it in another gospel, it's not like it adds or takes away anything, but it's not original and so therefore we need to remove it and that means we need to remove the verse attached to it. So we now have 25 and 27. No one, there's no great conspiracy corrupting your Bibles and taking things out, right? Don't listen to anything on YouTube that's American that says that, right? It's wrong. Uh, yeah. Yo, Alex. Um, obviously, Jesus coming to sin, therefore, the violence is justified and okay. Amen. Yeah. Yes, there are. Uh, partly because Romans 13 basically says as much. So in Romans 13, you have um, uh, uh, state governments, federal governments, rulers of this world who are actually appointed by God and part of their job is to punish disobedience. And that would, I think, include military and, and police forces and things like that. Uh, obviously, and I hope it never befalls anyone, but there may come, come various circumstances where it's right uh, for you to uh, physically defend yourself or someone else. I hope that never is the case, but, uh, you know, the, the proverbial axe-wielding maniac comes into the house, well, I said to my wife, I'll love her as Christ loves the church, that means I've got to be willing to die, uh, I want to bring up my kids in the wisdom and instruction of the Lord, that means I'm willing to sacrifice, I throw myself in the way and hope that I come out on top. Uh, but that's not a license for, all right, yeah, sweet, good, we can go kill people that we don't like. No, obviously not. As a matter of fact, Christians ought to be on the front foot when it comes as much as possible, as far as it depends on you to being at peace with all people we read in Romans 12, incidentally. Uh, but yes, it is, there are, there are movements within Christendom that have been a, a Christian pacifism that thinks that, that, that war or military work is only ever always wrong. I don't think you can uphold that view, partly because God identifies himself as the Lord of hosts. And the word host is a funny English word that basically means armies. He is the God. We worship the God of armies. So it's not wrong for a Christian to be in the military service. Now, if your military service says, we really don't like those people, we just want to kill them for fun, you might think, hmm, not sure in good conscience that I can get on board with that. And you should not go against your conscience and you definitely should not go against the word of God. But there are times where, yeah, as a follower of Jesus, it's right to engage in, in violent activity. Uh, last question. Oh, oh man. All right, quick. One, two. A web, then um, uh, uh, Jared. Oh, it's, I think it is fine to buy stuff at the temple uh, because it's still yours if you've paid for it and there's actually precedent in the Old Testament law itself for using uh, currency as a way of ensuring that the sacrificial system upholds its integrity. A really good example comes in the book of Numbers where you've got... A certain number of Levites who are set aside for work at the temple but not enough to represent the 12 tribes and so from the 12 tribes a payment is made in lieu of having the other Levites in order that all tribes get equal representation in the temple. Where's that in numbers, Ben? I can't remember. 
What does it say? Is it 273, the number? Yeah, somewhere like that. There's, there's a difference of 273. I don't know if it's chapter 8 or not, but I, I think that's okay. The problem with the pragmatism is not the buying and selling. It's doing it in a way that basically says Gentiles don't have time for you, don't have room for you. Whereas God's like, oh my gosh, you idiots. The whole point is that they would have been, nations would stream to the Temple Mount of the Lord and be included. So that, that's the, the, the religious pragmatism there. Last one, uh, Jared. Why are the Gentiles only allowed in the outer courts then? Oh, oh, oh wow. Um, God owns all people in the whole world, but He chose to take one nation to be His own chosen special people. He didn't choose them because there was anything good about them. As a matter of fact, they were the least of all nations. And He sets up with Israel what you might call a microcosm of how God relates to His people. God, His people, His place under His rule. And the idea was that would eventually be uh, result in blessing to people from all nations. The descendants of Abraham, as God's people in God's place under God's rule, would somehow be a thing that everyone else goes, I'm going to stream to that. Now, as to why he did it that way, I don't know that I can answer on behalf of God at that point. That's God's prerogative and his choice. He's always been sovereign in election. That did not mean that prior to Jesus, Gentiles could have no relationship with God. As a matter of fact, there's heaps of examples in the Old Testament of Gentiles becoming God-fearers and even becoming a part of the household of Israel, even if not fully-fledged Israelites. So, I think it's because God wanted to put world mission on the agenda by the time Jesus came, and that was at just the right time that in, in history, uh, and it should be sort of ripe and ready to burst out and to go to, to all the nations. But beyond that, I can't say, I can't answer for God. Brilliant question. Uh, what are we doing next? Prayer, who's praying? Oh, Tara, thanks, lovely. I'll put this down a little bit. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are perfect, holy, powerful, gentle, gracious, loving and majestic. You are worthy of all praise. Father, we thank you for the love and generosity that you show to us, your children. Thank you that you are sovereign and that you have a plan not only for our individual lives but for the salvation of this world. And thank you that you keep your promises and that you sent your son who died in our place, even though we are so undeserving. Father, with Easter less than a week away, we pray that you will make us salt and light amongst our community so that we will stand out as followers of your son, Jesus. We pray that the people in our workplaces, schools, boarding clubs, social groups and more will notice a differentness about us that gives credibility to our faith in you. We pray that you give confidence and opportunities to each one of us to ask at least one person we know to come to church this Easter. We know that it's only you who changes people's hearts, so we ask, Lord, that you will soften the hearts of those invited, and many will accept our invitation to this service, and that this would be one step towards them becoming disciples of your son Jesus themselves. Lord, we ask this so that your kingdom may grow and that our family may extend. This week, Lord, we pray for our Gladswood Hills Parish. We thank you, Father, for the positive relationships between Grace Anglican Church and Gladswood Hills Public School. We pray that this connection opens up opportunities for those in the school community who aren't Christians to connect to the church and hear the invitation to repent and believe in your son, Jesus. We pray for strengthened relationships in the church so that everyone is built up in Christ. This week, we ask that the upcoming Good Friday lunch is a joyful and encouraging time. Father, we continue to pray for the establishment of the easy English classes. We pray for Carol as she heads this up to have wisdom in arranging the practical components as well as recruiting volunteers. Most of all, we ask that these classes will become an efficient way for our church to love our community and make connections with people who otherwise would have no way of hearing about your son, Jesus. 
Lord, you are the father to the fatherless, the defender of widows, the one who sets the lonely in families and leads out the prisoners with singing. We know that you care for the flowers in the fields and the birds of the air and so much more for the people that you've created to bear your image. Lord, we ask for your graciousness and provision over the poor, needy and homeless. We ask that you provide them with food, water, shelter, safety and friendship. Please bless the work of groups like Anglicare who reach out to, to and help the poor and homeless in our community. Lord, thank you for our brothers and sisters whom you've called to spread the good news about your son. We thank you for the work of compassion. We pray that more and more children will become sponsored and will grow in their knowledge and love of you. We also give thanks for the opportunities of MTS. We praise you, Father, that Grace Anglican Churches has, have been able to send and partner with three new MTS um, trainees this year, Heather, James and Bridge. We pray that you will continue to stretch and grow them through their ministry apprenticeships and that their work would bear much fruit for seeing more people one for Christ and grow in maturity. We particular, in particular, we pray for James and Bridget. Lord, thank you that they have reached just over 80% of their financial support that they need to raise. And we ask that you raise up more partners for them so that they will reach 100% very soon. We pray for the many uni students who attended the Campus East barbecue a few weeks ago, that they would accept the invitation to come to Tuesday night Bible study. We pray specifically for the students a, a curious Muslim, and R, a, a firm Roman Catholic, that you will work in them to be open to the good news of Jesus and eventually will put their trust in you. Lord God, we thank you for the leaders that you've provided for our church. Lord, we pray that their ministries and their lives will continue to be moulded and shaped by you. We pray that you continue to grow them and work powerfully through them, that your word will be spread truthfully. Lord, thank you that you give each of us in your church roles to play in your kingdom, each gifts that glorify you. Lord, help us to use the gifts that you've given us to show others your love. Thank you for each of the programs that go on during the week. We pray that your spirit will be present throughout all these services and that all these services will glorify you. And Lord, thank you that for the love that you have for us. Thank you that you give us our identity so that we don't have to search for it in the world. Lord, please work in our lives and hearts and remind us, for, remind us of your truths daily. Change and mould us that your will becomes ours. Help us to be disciples who reject the desires of our flesh and to give us your Holy Spirit to teach us the fruits of your spirit, especially self-control in a world which craves instant gratification. And Lord, work in us to make us a holy people and work in us to change so that we may be presented blameless in front of you on the day of judgment. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you haven't done so and would like to do so, now is a great time to fill out your uh, online Connect form. If you have any questions, if you have more questions from tonight's talk, this is a good time to drop them down. You can also... Um, you can also speak to Ben after tonight's service. Uh, any comments or prayer points, feel free to drop them down as well. I'll give you a bit of time to do that.
online connect form. That is totally okay. Take as long as you need. I'll invite the musicians back up. Um, and soon we'll stand to sing our last song. Looking like we're done. Oh. Hey, check it out. By faith, the mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail. What an excellent song choice, whoever made this song choice. Let's together sing by faith. shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him Finished and the work is done. 
time together. I hope, this is, I hope that this evening you have been encouraged and challenged and convicted by what you have heard from God's Word. Jesus is the mighty, lowly Messiah coming to the city, and He is also the Lord Almighty coming to His temple. Please join me as we say together the words of the grace. Together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen. It's not over yet. Stick around for some supper. We'll see you next week. Ha, ha, ha.